We're fun, we swear. (laughs) (laughs) I don't even have anything. I don't have anything to add, so. (laughs) You're listening to The John Chi Show, hosted by three Korean-American adoptees diving headfirst into what it means to be adopted, Korean, American, and more. And now, here's your hosts, Nathan, Patrick, and KJ. So, Patrick, you posted recently about a new book that you are reading. Uh, I don't remember the title because you put it in your story, and we didn't chat about it later. So, what are you reading? Uh, Because I was super interested in hearing about it, and I probably will add it to my cart later today. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to hold it up for the camera for our listeners to not be able to see. Uh, But it is a book (laughs) called Adopted Adopted Territory. Transnational Korean Adoptees and the Politics of Belonging by Elena J. Kim. Um, Elena Kim is not herself an adoptee, but became immersed in this world um, in 1999, I believe, is when she started doing a lot of this research. And the book so far has been amazing um, insofar as that it is a really good retelling and recapping of the whole history of Korean adoption um, from... From even adoption as a, a thing in the past, like before even transnational adoptees or uh, adoptions were a thing, uh, up to 2008, I think, is when it gets to that point. I'm only on Chapter 4. Um, it's a lot to take in. But it, it, it has been a really good read so far. Um, I've learned a lot of stuff. And yeah, it's been... I hope you guys pick it up and read it at some point because... Um, it's very, very informative, and you get to see a lot of things through a different lens, I suppose, I would say, than what we've been doing here with the show. So, um, Does it read like a, a collegiate history book? Does it read like a memoir? Does it read like a collection of fine? Like, how does it read? Right. Uh, definitely more like a collegiate like study, almost. It's very okay. much like a, a scholarly text, I would say. Um, it's... Not so much a, it is very first person from her perspective, but I think she does a lot, a really good job of bringing in multiple perspectives to, to speak on it from who she talked to and then transcribing that into the work. I think, uh, she does a really good job of that. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I just picked up a book, uh, on audible. Uh, It's called when my name was Kyoku, Kyoko by Linda Sue Park. Um, and it is, I believe it's a memoir. I haven't started it yet. It's a memoir about her time living in Korea under Japanese occupation. Um, and so I think, so for me, like, I, I don't know why, but I've just always, uh, felt a deep responsibility to understand like a native Korean quote unquote native Korean mindset and worldview and point of view. Um, and I think, I think part of that is probably just me wrestling with being adopted and being like, well, this is who I would have been. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think I've just not given up on like trying to be as a way of navigating a third culture, like trying to be as natively Korean as I can, knowing that I'll be plenty American by the time that I die, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> right. so, uh, I think just having, having this book, I'm really excited to hear it, be, to hear the, uh, the point of view of somebody who lived through Japanese occupation and maybe understand that a little bit better because in contrast, like growing up in America in the nineties and two thousands, like Japanese culture, uh, especially through like anime and stuff like that was like all the rage. Um, and then, uh, being, I don't know, me, me being me, I really liked the last samurai and then you have Mulan and things like that. So, you know, I got lots of not Korean, but East Asian culture influences, uh, in a very positive light. And so to hear a Korean perspective of like here, like is the other side of these cultural influences is really exciting to me. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to read it. Uh, Nathan, what has your uh, relationship to Korean history been like? Having three kids, I don't have a whole lot of time to read like you, like you too. <laughs> I <laughs> I would love to have had more time to read some books, but lately most of my research and my uh, awareness has been done online. So I've been searching, um, you know, a lot of especially with our our current uh, guest. Uh, Glenn, we, I made sure to go through his websites and and uh, watch his documentaries on on YouTube. And some of the stories that were coming out of that were um, fascinating. One of the stories that uh, um, he had on from one of his interviews was a um, uh, she's half Korean, half uh, American, and she was a product of the GI 
um, uh, the GIs from the Korean War being in Korea, and her mother was a prostitute. And so the Korean government, after she was born, well, tried to, I guess, influence and adopt these children of of mixed race. And that was one of the things that she was saying started the adoption, um, uh, I guess, surge um, back then in the in the 50s and 60s. So it was an interesting to hear that and think, oh, wow, yeah, that does make sense that that is something that would happen like that. So um, yeah, I, I would like to dive more into that, that history of, of where the adoption did start and where these organizations started. Well, Nathan, you should definitely get this book because they that's one of the things that they cover is, <clears throat> or that Elena covers there is about how it was initially mixed race because the Korean government, once they saw that they could get these kids adopted, I guess I should say, um, they were, initially it was all about mixed race because it was about very much that patriarchal Confucian era, like thinking that Confucian is thinking mindset to keep the blood within, um, like their country to keep it pure. But then when they found out that it was, it was very lucrative and, and they could do those things, you know, adoption became more, much more of a, a program as opposed to not, it became more of an economic program as opposed to a social program. Um, and then, yeah, and it, it went from being about to about getting these mixed race children adopted into more, you know, how many kids can we get adopted, and what's that? What's that look like? And they eventually put in a rule where you had to, you uh, you had to um, meet a quota for domestic adoptions in Korea uh, in order to continue to adopt internationally, um, and that came up out of '88 uh, after the Olympics because they did not get shown in a favorable light uh, when, when that happened. But I thought it was pretty interesting going from looking at those origins of being mixed-race children to get adopted. It makes sense. It's like, you know, they have fathers elsewhere. If we can get them over there, let's, let's do that. To becoming, you know, how can we, how can we sustain our economy in a, in a certain way uh, with, with this practice? And then, you know, then not seeing it in such a great light and it's how how can we improve our own society and improve the way that we do things here domestically while still being able to for people that think transnational adoption is a good thing to continue to do such a thing so um definitely nathan all i say all that to yeah, say get this be, book because it is i will be pretty putting that down on my list it yeah might I be the first book i've read in five years ten years <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's wild like patrick listen to you talk about that i don't I don't remember where I heard it uh, or how I came across it, but I just remember hearing um, like adoptees were Korea's greatest export for a while. Um, yeah. And like I heard it as a joke. Uh, and then like to know that adoption went from a social program to an economic program is really heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, by the time that, that we release this episode will be six days into National Adoption Awareness Month. And um, I don't know about y'all. I get uh, very annoyed about any type of month. Um and just because like, it feels like there are so many months, you know, uh, and so you're like doubling and tripling up on months to like make a thing happen. Um, but this one obviously is deeply important to me, this National Adoption Awareness Month. And uh, what I love about our conversation with Glenn about what we're trying to do, um, and really, I think what we what I at least hope to do, I haven't really talked to you guys about it, but it's going out on air. Um, <laughs> but what uh, what I hope that we do is we able we're able to because we are now adult adoptees reclaim some of our narrative uh, and really kind of blast uh, adoption awareness month with like, hey, here's what adoption has done for me uh, and to me. 20 years on, 30 years on, 40 years on, um, you know, and uh, and be able to say like, oh, hey, there are just like um, all of the race conversations that have been happening uh, in 2020 have like just kind of uh, opened people's minds up to the, the reality that this is uh, deeply entangled and needs to be like straightened out as much as you can, you know, it's just like opening people's eyes to like adoption isn't what you think it is or isn't what you've been told it is and that there are so many other sides and so many other stories and things. Um, so hopefully uh, if you're following us, we'll give you things to share, things to learn, uh, and people, you know, like adoption 
stories aren't monolithic stories, just like, uh, you know, all Asian American stories aren't monolithic stories. And so and they're not all um, negative and they're not all positive. Right. There's, exactly. There's there are so many shades range. and colors. Yeah. yeah so uh, we want to be able to bring some light to that. So uh, this will be an interesting month for us, I think. <laughs> yeah. And KJ, I just want to touch on something that you said. I think that using the word reclaim that reclaim our narrative, I think is really great because that is a lot of our, a lot of, so the initial adoptees that came over from Korea, you know, their stories are being written by their adoptive parents, by the social workers that help them get here. And at the end of the day, it becomes less about the adoptees experience and more about how the people that benefited or helped facilitate this adoption, um, what happened in that story through their eyes. And so I think that we are now in a group that's <clears throat> even has more opportunity because of the internet and how how much smaller the world has been made because of that of technology where we can now start to truly reclaim that whereas in 95 or 99 when you're looking on the internet you see random blog posts or you see random stories that have been told about adoptees um, from their perspective but it's really hard it would be really hard to parse through and find all of that so we're now at a point where we can do that, and that's what we've been doing with the show, and that's what Glenn has done with Side by Side and Given Away, um, <clears throat> and not just us though, but like a, a lot of or all of the other uh, adoptee podcasts out there. I don't want anybody to think that it's just us and nobody else. There are a lot of good things out there uh, where we are reclaiming that narrative and now beginning to share our stories from our own perspectives. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, uh, one of the things that struck me, and I've there's a hundred different stories on sidebysideproject.com that you can go and you can listen. Um, and what's interesting to me is in the few that I watched preparing for the interview, uh, and, and I found this to be true of myself, when I first started talking about my adoption story, uh, I would always tell the part of the story that was really my mom's part to tell or my dad's part to tell. And so, uh, you know, one of the, our, our beliefs on the show is only tell things from your own experience, um, which is, it's really hard then to say, because a lot of our adoption uh, happened before our adoption. Like that was the stories that were told to us was, you know, our parents were preparing for uh, adoption for however many days, years, decades, whatever. Uh, but then like our adoption story is like it feels very historical and so like being able to say only what is our own perspective really makes us think about okay so starting from the moment like my earliest memory and going from there what does it mean to be adopted what is my story of adoption and so i hope that that this month um through books and through um, other things through listening to content that uh fellow adoptees figure out a way to find their own voice uh, so that we can reclaim that narrative, you know? Um, so it's not just saying like, well, my mom, uh, you know, wanted a kid, blah, 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 or my parents wanted, you know, all of that. But it starts with, I was adopted and, you know, and goes from there uh, and not not telling that. So I'm interested to see, and I'm really excited to see uh, more stories, more posts, more video content, more podcasts, whatever, more chatter in Facebook groups um, about uh, what adoption is for you, uh, not what it means, not what it represents, but what it is for you, uh, and finding our voice and then just getting loud about it. And one of the things I really appreciate that, uh, um, with those stories on Glenn's site, uh, is that they're all discovering something about their, their own stories. And when I discovered my own story as well, that was something that I had a pre-notion that I kind of knew or I thought what the story was of why I was given up for adoption and things like that. But I didn't really know until I I tried to discover some of that. I went out and, and researched it and I searched for my biological family. And you know, I, I figured it was based on money, as we've been discussing. The Korea was fairly poor at that time and they were in poverty. So I figured it was money. And then when I actually found out it was about money, but it was about money because I had six other siblings <laughs> and the oldest one was getting ready to have a baby as well. And it was just, that made more sense to me. And I wouldn't have ever expected those details to come out of it unless I had searched and found that out. So my awareness of that was, was that, that discovery is, is that search. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to hear all the other, uh, people on Glenn's site say similar things that they thought, they had these pre notions of what, why they were adopted, or what their parents were like, or things like that, and then they discover something either different or kind of similar to that narrative. But it's uh, that discovery, I think, is what it's all about. So everyone goes through their own. 
Remember how we were going to do this so that like we didn't trend super heavy and dark? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so it is. <laughs> so I'm going to blame that Glenn. Was a great conversation. That Glenn, was a great conversation. Darn it, man. You did, you did too good on your work, and now we're all like in our heads about it. So, without any further delay, here is our interview with Glenn Mori. Once again, you can catch his new Audible original tomorrow. It is called Given Away, and it is a collection of uh, the stories that he filmed from his side-by-side project, which you can go and watch at any time at your leisure. All 100 of them are posted at sidebysideproject.com. Uh, here is our interview. Here we go. All right. Welcome back to uh, the John Chi Show. This is episode 12. We are here with Glenn Mori. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, like uh, like all of our episodes, we usually just start with a little bit of a uh, backstory about yourself and just tell everyone on our viewers uh, and listeners uh, about yourself and uh, and your adoption. Well, I, you know, I may be the oldest guest you've had so far. <laughs> Whoa, um, we're not ageist on the show. Bro. Oh, yeah. You well, take it easy with that age. That's talk. part of our canon. We're definitely not ageist. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I literally could be all of your fathers. So, uh, all right. I was, a, I was born and adopted in 1960. And, uh, uh, that's easy math. That makes me 60 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so so I was actually abandoned in Seoul at the age of two weeks and uh, middle of the winter, I guess, oh. and, and not a shred of identification hmm. and ended up in City Hall where apparently Holt came through City Hall, uh, you know, periodically and and took those infants and children who were likely to survive uh, and took them back to their orphanage at Nokbun Dong, which was in Seoul. And uh, I was there for a few months and then was adopted in July of that year. I uh, was on a plane with 80 other kids uh, to Portland and Landed in July and taken to Littleton, Colorado, mm. uh, which is about as far away from Seoul, Korea as you could <laughs> possibly be. Uh, and grew up uh, as the younger brother of three older sisters and then the older brother of three more adopted kids. My parents kind of got into it. After me, they adopted a kid every three years. Oh, wow. Uh, for three more kids, one from <laughs> Korea and two domestically. And I, uh, yeah, so we, I, I grew up in Littleton, Colorado. I was, me and my brother, uh, also through Holt, were the only Asians, as far as I could tell, in Littleton. So, uh, yeah, that's the story. That's that's amazing. So with the seven, I'm also in my old, my biological family. I'm the seventh child as well. It seems that uh, that seems to be a trend. Big families with a lot of uh, adopted, um, either adopted families or biological families. Both. Like, we're hearing a lot of that. Well, the size of our family is only exceeded by its dysfunctionality. So. Uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, maybe bigger is better, but not in our family. It definitely <laughs> was not. Um, you know, I, I, to this day, have no idea why why our parents adopted me and us. I, I have no idea. They never told us. Uh, my father rarely spoke to me and never talked to me about anything of import. Um, my mother was was very nice and a great mom, but but was a pretty damaged human being. Uh, when she was a little girl, her, her mother died and her father gave her up to foster and she bounced around relatives' houses and stuff like that and just had a really tough time and, and, and really carried the scars of that for her entire life. And, and, and as a result, I just, I just don't really know that there was, well, I do know there was no, there was no family cohesiveness or or a dynamic of of communication, even mm -hmm. uh, let alone you know real close bonds between siblings and or between us and our parents. There just it just didn't exist, and so 
And so with all of these family members that I have, you know, immediate family, um, I never see any of them. Hmm. Do, are they close with each other that, at all as well? Or no, it's just no. everybody went their separate ways, essentially. Yeah, my, my father died when I was 18. Uh, he died of cancer after a long illness. And as soon as that happened, um, uh, the family just started breaking apart. Um, and so maybe my dad in his, in his silence, uh, provided more of a, more of a core than I even ever (laughs) knew. Uh, because as soon as he was gone, it just was all over. And, uh, and so no, I, I actually don't have much of a relationship and I rarely see any of my siblings. And what about the one that's adopted? The were you guys? Well, I have three that closer? are adopted. I, I have mean, a younger Korean brother. Adopted, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, um, so I didn't. I I was not a well-adjusted adopted kid, even though I was adopted as a baby, and and I had a lot of issues with with who I was, and as a result. You know, the fact that my brother was almost the same thing as what I was, I didn't much like him. Mm. And I didn't have much to do with him. Uh, he was three years younger than I was, so that made it easy. But, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm embarrassed by this and I'm ashamed of this because I know that all the reasons I don't have a relationship with my brother really had to do with me. They didn't have anything to do with him and they had to do with me and the fact that I didn't much like myself. Hmm. Yeah. I think all family dynamics are different. Not, not even if you're adopted or biological, I've, I've heard a lot of different stories from uh, friends who are biological and they don't speak with their brothers. They don't speak with their you know parents anymore. Um, so uh, every, every family has definitely different dynamics. That's, you know, sorry to, to hear that with yours, but uh, I'm, Wondering with uh, all of the stories that you've heard, um, you know, with with your documentary that you've been doing too, are there, um, you know, things that you've heard from those that are similar that that you know that you can relate to or that they can relate to you? Well, you know, everybody's story is different, of course. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, but when you when you talk to a hundred people there some things began to be similar and and there were certainly a number of stories well actually many stories where people were adopted uh alongside another adopted person from korea or adopted with a biological sibling um and and my take on on the differences between those is it seemed like those who were adopted with a biological sibling were very, very close. And, and in, because one was older than the other, um, they were almost the guardian for their younger sibling. Um, they, they, they had the more difficult time transitioning, um, but they took upon themselves the responsibility of of making sure that their sibling was okay. And I mean, even to the point where they would taste all of their food, Mm -hmm. uh, they would help them with the language issues, you know? So, uh, yeah, it was, they were very close relationships. On the other hand, many of the relationships that were described to us in these stories that were not biological, um, many of those siblings were not close at all, uh, for reasons ranging from, they were very dissimilar people to the family dynamics just didn't contribute to that. Yeah. So <clears throat> taking all that in and, and thinking about your and hearing about your experience growing up and then like your relationship with your adopted brother um, and then growing up in Littleton, what was your first <clears throat> foray into either Korean culture or even the adoptee community? When did you first, when, when did you first start to um, kind of investigate that side of yourself or what prompted that uh, to happen? Well, I was pretty young. I was 42. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty young. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry guys. Um, Age is just a number. Remember? <laughs> 
You know, you know, as I said, I, I grew up very, very uncomfortable and unhappy with being Korean, especially mm -hmm. uh, being adopted secondarily um, for a lot of reasons um, that are that are similar to to in to many of the stories that we filmed for Side by Side. Um, but uh, as a result of that. I was desperate to construct an identity for myself, uh, you know, a personhood that was based on anything but those things. And so the most obvious choice of what you're going to make yourself out of was, was work. It was career. And so for a long time, I, I identified solely and I thought of myself solely as, as a professional person. Um, and I wouldn't, ever allow my ethnicity or or my origin to enter into the telling of my story um, or how I described myself for that matter. Um, I mean, to the point where, where I would be meeting a stranger at a coffee shop for a meeting and and I wouldn't tell them that I was Korean, <laughs> making it much, much more difficult to identify. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, when I was when I was in my early 40s, I, I actually was involved in a film project that was about uh, race in America uh, and race specifically in the television industry. And uh, which is ridiculous for me to be making this film because I was not racially conscious um, or fluent. Mm -hmm. So. So here I am making this project and, and these people are telling their stories about experiences of people of color in the television and entertainment industry. And I'm just like the audience. I'm hanging on every word because I can't believe people are talking about this stuff. I just can't believe it. And I can't believe that I could identify with so much of it. Mm. And none of these people were adopted. It was just a matter of being Asian or being of color in America and being a working person and what that meant. And uh, I remember a, a woman who who described her experience moving with her parents to from the Philippines uh, to Indiana when she was just a kid. And she described, you know, going to school and people spitting on her as she walked down the sidewalk and just the abuse that she took. And, and, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say I identified with that because, you know, when, when, when I was growing up in the sixties in Littleton, Colorado, attitudes toward Asian Americans, uh, you know, weren't great. Yeah. I mean, our, all of our parents had served in either world war II, uh, Korea, or even Vietnam, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we're very much a product of that wartime propaganda mm -hmm. and the negativity, negative portrayals of Asians on purpose by America and by our institutions. And so their kids were also became a product of that. And, and I got tormented on a daily basis. Uh, so anyway, um, it was amazing for me to hear some of these other people talking about this. And, and it really woke me up to the fact that, that if I was ever going to be a real person, an authentic person, someone who was actually inside the physical body that I inhabit, <laughs> um, that I was going to have to come to terms with all of this. And, and, uh, when I started talking to my wife about this, uh, she was very relieved, first of all, because, <laughs> because I never would talk about any of this. Um, <laughs> and secondly, she directed me uh, to, to a number of opportunities to begin expanding this interest, including going to a, uh, a uh, conference uh, in, in Minneapolis for adoptees uh, with the organization CAN, K-A-A-N. And, uh, and that was my first uh, adoptee event. What year was that? 19, or no, excuse me, 2002. Okay. That's great. So, None of us have been to a conference. We've all discussed wanting oh, to, though. We want to yeah. go. Yeah. We could, we so, could go yeah. virtually, I guess. No. 
<laughs> well, I know they're but I, not right now. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm so glad to hear that you want to go because, because I got to tell you, I mean, for me, going to this thing was transformational. It, 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 I I mean, that sounds kind of overly dramatic and, and over the top, but I don't know any other way of saying it. It changed my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm not a spiritual or religious person particularly. Um, and so I'm not speaking in those terms. What I'm saying is that I came out of there a different person who was behaving and acting differently in, in really important aspects of my life. And, 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 you know, all the way from the first moment when I walked in, I walked into the, the Doubletree Minneapolis, uh, which is really nice, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I walked up to this, this registration table where there were three young women behind the table. And, and it was amazing because I was immediately greeted and accepted and welcomed exactly for being the things that I had so despised about myself for mm -hmm. so long. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it just was, I'll, I'll never forget the feeling of that. And in fact, uh, two of the young ladies behind that table are friends of mine to this day. Um, uh, in fact, I, I hung out with them in, at conferences in 2019, which is the last time we had conferences. So, um, it was, it was really an amazing experience. Um, and it's where I woke up to the, uh, the power, the, uh, the potential of, of stories, our stories mm -hmm. to not only help people like us, but just to help ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I really love that you, the way you described that feeling that you got when you walked into the conference. So I've been reading the book Adopted Territory by Elena Kim, and I'm on this part of, she's talking about adoptee kinship and how that is something that's developed within our community. And it's almost an unspoken thing. But when we either get together or when we first breach and breach the community and find those other people, it's like part of that, part of that hole that's in your soul or that's missing fills up and you can't really describe it. Uh, but the way that you described it, even even in those certain words, it, it, I mean, it really it really connected for me just by reading, having read that book uh, just very recently. Um, and, and it's really interesting. And it honestly makes me want to go to a conference even more. I'm like, let's go yeah. open the doors, but wear masks. <laughs> and also only 20 people can go. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we'll slowly build up to it. 20 um, people in 20 different rooms. 1% of that. Exactly. <laughs> Korean outside. American adopters, of course. <laughs> 20 rooms outside. Yeah, um, no, that, I've always oh, wanted to go too. Like, yeah. like you said, that, that, uh, I mean, Dan, you know, Matthew's talked about it as well. And I think we've heard it from a lot of people is that they are, you know, um, very eye opening and beneficial for, for a lot of people. And they might not be beneficial for everyone that goes, but I think majority of the people that go, it, it's, uh, um, they get something out of that. And that's why, you know, that's why I've wanted to go for sure. But let, let, let me say two things though, to that one is, one is that if you did the math, if you took all the conferences that have ever been held for the last 25 years for, for adoptees and you eliminated, you know, the duplication of all of those people that go to multiple conferences, you would still end up with a number that was less than probably 15% yeah. of the total adoptee population. So it's not like everybody goes to these things and it's right. not like everybody even has the opportunity to go to these things. It costs money to travel. Mm -hmm. It takes time mm -hmm. to travel. People have families, people have lives. And so that's why th that was one of the very first reasons that we did side by side so that people could have the opportunity to experience the stories of other Korean adoptees, even if they would never make it to a conference. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's talk about that because your um um your side by side documentary um which is you know out of a Korean orphanage and into the the world uh, it's been released on your website and something I wanted to ask as a question on your website it is a hundred people 
um, with each of their stories and you can click on their stories and uh, view them. Is there a longer documentary of all of them? Because I know there's a shorter documentary, which was the New York Times one on YouTube, um, which I don't know. That was probably a separate edit that you did maybe specifically for them. But um, is there a longer cut version of the full thing? I know it said something about it being premiered uh, at a lot of locations and things around uh, the country. Um, so can you talk a little bit about those differences? Sure, sure. First of all, the interviews that are on sidebysideproject.com, mm -hmm. those are complete and virtually unedited. I mean, the only stuff we took out was like do-overs or mistakes or what have you, uh, or um, just technical issues. So otherwise, they are complete. And and I think that's really important because because honestly it's not just what people say, it's the context in which they say it. And it's their body language with which they say it. It's, it's the whole thing. And, and to be able, I, I wanted people to be able to experience those interviews as I did in the room, mm -hmm. because that was remarkable. That was a life-changing experience for me. And and I wanted people to be able to experience them that way. And so I, I to this day, believe that that to get the very, very most out of the experience of Side by Side, those full interviews are a wonderful way to do that. And a lot of people do that. Uh, the, the website rolled out uh, mid-2018, and, and it, people continue to go to that website and consume a lot of videos. So... Uh, but obviously not everybody has the time or inclination to consume 21 hours of video. <laughs> I was going to so, ask you how long that was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got uh, nothing but time these days. So. <laughs> well, have at it. Uh, <laughs> just don't forget to eat and stuff like that. But, um, but, uh, the, so we went to the other end of the spectrum as, uh, you know, from there. We, we said, let's make a short, let's make a 38 minute film. That's what we made. We made, we made something that people could watch in under an hour. And uh, we didn't really intend to do that from the beginning, uh, to be honest, because, because I didn't want to take the responsibility of selecting stories and excerpts to include in the film. You know, you, you you totally affect the takeaways and the and the messages of the film mm -hmm. by your editorial selections and and I was really afraid that that I would um, exhibit some of my own uh, inclinations or bias or whatever you know by doing that and 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 moreover I was very concerned that 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 other people would think that that had happened. So, so the thing that I want to say about the short film is that the, the excerpts, the stories that we selected, the excerpts that we selected are, we, we picked them because they were the most representative of the 100 stories. Mm -hmm. We could have picked excerpts and stories that were different and unusual and, and striking and, you know, all of those things. But we really didn't want to do that. We wanted to, as well as we possibly could, we wanted to represent the 100 stories. And even then, we're not representing the adoptee universe, mm -hmm. you know, but at least we wanted to represent the 100 stories in a fair fashion. So from there, we, we cut the project down even further. We worked with the New York Times to create an even shorter version of the documentary called Given Away. It's 16 minutes long, and uh, it's been seen a ton of times. I, I I don't know the exact number because New York Times won't tell you. Uh, but uh, it's about 380 thousand on YouTube right now. Yeah, you know, well, it was prop. My guess I'm, is I'm it sure was more. You know, ten times that on yeah. the homepage of the New York Times, where it resided for a week. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then from there, we kind of went back in the other direction. We created a, a video art installation that was comprised of excerpts from all 100 stories, um, and and there were 12 screens in this in this exhibition, and each screen had a different theme on it, a different part 
or a different aspect of our story, like uh, memories of Korea for those people who were adopted in an older age. Um, uh, adoption stories themselves, you know, the transition from from Korea to to the adoptive country. Um, growing up, you know, people grew up in in the most amazing and and disparate uh, variations of of adoptive homes. That I I I I was always. Uh, I never cease to be surprised by the variations that came out of adoptive upbringings. Hmm. Um, you know, to the desire to search and the desire to visit Korea and and the the process of having your own children and and all of those things came into play in these on these different screens. Uh, and all in all, that ex that exhibit uh, housed some five hours of content, um, and it. It, it exhibited in Seoul and New York City uh, last fall, uh, and um, it just was an amazing experience to be able to exhibit like that. Um, and then, of course, now we're in the process of uh, getting ready to launch our latest adaptation, which is we're releasing Side by Side as an Audible. Mm -hmm. um, so an audible original. Uh, nice. It's going to be about five hours long and uh, which is shorter than most uh, audible books, but mm. still it's a lot of content. Um, but it's also the first time that we've created something that features in addition to the stories, it features um, commentary by me. Oh, cool. nice. Okay. And so I talk about the project. I talk about what we learned. I talk about how the stories that, that the listener is hearing, how it relates to the overall and the lifelong journey of a Korean adoptee um, or any inner country adoptee to some degree uh, or even any adoptee to some mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um I'm very, very excited about that coming out. We're going to be, you know, presenting to a completely new audience. Uh, meanwhile, we continue to do online screenings for all kinds of great organizations, including one uh, coming up this weekend, starting this weekend, extending to the following weekend for Adoptee Hub yeah. uh, in Minneapolis. So um, that's going to be exciting, too. I hope your listeners join us for that. Well. Yeah. I first want to say congratulations on all of these, just not only on accomplishing this project, but now getting to release it in so many different forms. I think releasing it one time and putting it on the website is one thing, but now to get to do it in so many different ways and share it in so many different ways is amazing. Um, I, I, want to, I, I want to say also that what really drew me to this project and when I found it online in the first place was the way that you framed the interviews and how you put it from your perspective, like we were standing behind the camera with you and we're watching these people relate their stories. Um, I thought that was extremely powerful. And I like now on the audible where you're talking about the process a little bit too, and adding these notes in. Um, and that was one of the things that I had wondered and wanted to ask you was a hundred interviews all over the world is a huge undertaking. That's a massive project. Um, I wondered what was maybe two things. What was the most difficult part of like putting that together and then going through with it? And then what was maybe the most fulfilling part or the thing that you found that was easier to do or, or that gave you the greatest, uh, whatever a synonym for good is feeling. <laughs> <laughs> um, Difficulty. Uh, that's a that's an odd word, I think. Um, I mean, I, I really wanted to do this project, so nothing seemed difficult in the sense that I didn't want to do that part. Um, right. uh, but what it was, was it was a long journey uh, emotionally uh, for me personally. Um, I was not the same person at the end of filming this or even at the end of post-production on this as I was at the beginning. Um, 
I thought I thought that I had really kind of unwrapped a lot of my issues and 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 thinking and and processes about adoption and and race. But I I hadn't even started, I think, in retrospect. Um I went through so many, I had so many epiphanies and so many emotional moments and, and so many breakdowns over the course of making this project. I can't even really count them. They, they happened all the time. And uh, uh, it was a very, very difficult process to go through. Um, but in that difficulty, I knew we were doing something really important. And, and I think that and I appreciate, you know, you saying what you said, Patrick, about, you know, us getting this project into so many forms. But honestly, you know, no one's ever done this. So no one's ever, you know, filmed 100 stories of 100 people, seven countries, 16 cities, six languages, you know, and really told this broadly representative story, not only a broadly representative story, but deeply personal in every case. You know, no one's ever done this before. And these, and these stories are so incredibly valuable that, that I would have, I would have felt really bad had we not been able to, to completely uh, optimize and, and distribute these stories as, as far as we could get them. And, and I continue to feel that way. I don't think we're done after, after this project, uh, after the audible thing, I, we're going to continue to try to put these things out into the world because they're so immeasurably valuable uh, to adoptees, to adoptive families, to future adoptive parents. Mm -hmm. uh, they're so valuable. They're so valuable to society at large so that, so that maybe we can begin to see a different kind of narrative, a, you know, social narrative emerging about, adoption and about intercountry adoption and so forth. So, so we, we just had an, a, a huge responsibility to get these stories as far and wide as we could. And to touch on what, what Patrick said too, on the way you filmed this for the viewers and listeners who haven't seen that, the, um, you, you filmed it with a thing called an eye direct, which uh, mm -hmm. attached to the camera um, so that they saw you and you saw them while they were recording. Um, in addition, you filmed it portrait style, which I felt was, or did you crop it afterwards? Because that, I mean, the way you did that made it just very personal. Like you were there standing in front of the person talking to them while I was watching it um, and the viewers. So that decision to do that, that you you made before, going through all of those, I think is, is brilliant and really involves the viewers um, while they're watching those. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and, and I wish I'd thought of that when Patrick asked me the most difficult part, because, <laughs> because uh, the most difficult aspect of making this project was, was the, was the uh, vertical format. <laughs> um, it presented a billion problems mm -hmm. all the way from, the tripod that wouldn't go vertical. <laughs> most tripods won't go vertical for mm -hmm. video and uh, most camera heads won't go vertical and, uh, um, and then captioning all the way to captioning. There are mm -hmm. no automated programs replacing uh, captions. Uh, so we did, we did all 25,000 or so captions. We wow. did them manually. Manually like, on the side. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So we paid a price for that decision, yeah. uh, but there was no really no going back once we started that way. <laughs> um, in terms of the eye direct, uh, you know, most people don't don't consciously notice that, but it having direct eye contact with the camera is really the only way to replicate what I experienced in the studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, because if I'm the only one that ever gets to look in the storyteller's eyes, that's really sad, I think. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should have the opportunity to look in these people's eyes while they're telling their stories. And that's that's what the eye direct allows. Um, at the same time, it doesn't like freak out the, the storyteller to look into a camera because they don't see a camera, they see me. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the way it works technologically. So um, it was, we, we had some really wonderful technological assistance, you know, in getting to where we wanted to be. The, the, other, the other thing about the shooting format was that we, we lit and framed every, every interview identically. Mm-hmm. Um, we wanted to do that because, and we, and, and the reason, and the reason we shot it in vertical was so that we would minimize the environment. So, and we shot on white to, to uh, mm-hmm. eliminate the environment. And, uh, but the, the point of all of that was not artistic necessarily. I mean, I kind of like the clean look of that, but, but the real point of it was to democratize the stories. I didn't want anybody to look at one of these storytellers and make a judgment based on anything but their story. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want them to look at like where they were or, you know, the room that they were standing in or, or the location or uh, th- that's too easy. I wanted, mm-hmm. I wanted there to be no difference in playing field, you know, for anybody. I wanted it to be absolutely level. So, so you can't tell the, the difference between um, uh, any of these people socioeconomically. Uh, you can't tell the difference between them uh, in terms of what they've achieved in life. Uh, you can't tell the difference between them in terms of what challenges they're facing. Um, all you know is their stories and what they've been willing to reveal, which was a lot. Mm-hmm. So to that point, how what was the process like to find the storytellers, to find the hundred people to, to bring in? I, I, I'm assuming you didn't just know them all uh, from going to conferences and you're like, I'm going to film you and you and you. Uh, what was that process like? Well, um, what we did is, is, well, let me, let me take a step back. The first thing we did is that we interviewed, I don't know if, if you all realize it or if you've made your way through the, the website like this, but the hundred people include 11 aged out Koreans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or those. actually 12, 12 aged out Koreans, mm-hmm. uh, 11 of which we filmed in Korea. I was... I was very determined that that be part of this project because we were with them side by side in these orphanages and whatever you want to call it, divine intervention or random luck. uh, We ended up somewhere different and they ended up somewhere different. And, and, and that's part of our story too, you know? And, uh, and so I think that the fact that we were in orphanages with other people, I think, I think is, is important. And so we knew though, that that was going to be hard. It was going to be hard to find and identify 12 people who were willing to tell their stories as aged out people, Koreans who had aged out of orphanages. Um, There's so much bias and discrimination against, against them in Korea. And, and, and a lot of these people go through life keeping this a secret. They don't tell anybody. One guy didn't tell his wife for 10 years hmm. while they were married. So, um, and is that 18 years old when they get aged out? They or age out at 18. 18. Some of the older people that we interviewed, um, aged out when they were like 14 or 15. Oh, uh, right. and they aged out with nothing. They, mm-hmm. they, they aged out, they sp- ate their next meal on the street, normally stolen or fought for. And, hmm. and it was, you know, that way from that point. But anyway, we, we went to Korea, we found these, uh, uh, 11 people and then 12 people who would be interviewed. Um, and, and that's where it really started. Um, but then we, we realized that once we had those in the can that we could really make this project happen. So I put out announcements on social media, Mm. telling people what we were trying to do and adoptees, you know, all over the world got in touch with me. I then had a phone conversation with most of them. Uh, of course, you know, we couldn't go everywhere. So we looked at the cities where we had the most responses and that's where we went within those cities though. And I think, I think this is important to understand. Um, you know, we filmed everyone who wanted to tell their story. 
we didn't say no to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, again, we didn't want to make those decisions that would impact yeah. right. the content of the project. And so, so we filmed everybody. Uh, and furthermore, we didn't edit anyone out. We filmed 100 stories, and there are 100 stories on SideBySideProject.com. So, um, yeah, that's the way it worked. So I'm curious um, if we can uh, just kind of take a pause just from the, the logistics of the project, which I could probably sit and talk to you about for hours. <laughs> I'm a nerd and love about love hearing about how that stuff works. But I'm curious, um, Glenn, you said uh, a number of times now um, your first conference and then in the Side by Side project uh, that there has been uh, a number of kind of foundation shaking realizations for you um and i'm curious hearing going through side by side and hearing a hundred stories uh where i guess generally the question i guess is where did you start and where are you now but um i think really it's just how do you think about yourself as a, a korean american and as an adoptee um now versus when you were running away from those things Well, uh, there, there's really no comparison. Um, I didn't think of myself as, as, I mean, I knew I was Korean, obviously, but, but I would never have identified myself as Korean American. I never would have even identified myself as a minority, I think, Mm -hmm. or, or as a person of color. Um, and I, I would never have willingly identified myself as an adoptee. Uh, so, so at this point, um, you know, one of the things that doing this project required of me was to be very, very open about all of that. Uh, and even, even when I entered into the very beginning of this project, I knew that if this went where I thought it was going to go, I would have to make a commitment to myself that I would be completely open and completely authentic about these aspects of my, of my existence. And, and that I would answer any question and that I would, and that I would not do so defensively the way I had done that my entire life. Um, so that's the difference. Mm. I mean, can you be that? Can you occupy that really, um, without defensiveness, with complete openness, I mean, yeah, we all get tired of, well, where are you from or whatever, you know, some perfect stranger asking you if you've ever met your biological parents, you know, it's bizarre when that happens, but, but honestly, I'm even different about those things at this point. I, I, I'm at the point today where I want to be so open about those things. I don't want to be defensive about them at all. And I'm, I'm willing to talk to anybody who wants to know for whatever reason, I mean, you know, up to a point, you know, but, but, uh, I mean, there are some people who simply want to disagree with me about things, which is fine. Um, but I don't typically talk to them for very long. (laughs) And your Um, wife co-directed this. You could, I was gonna say your wife co-directed it. She, you could do a, uh, uh. A biography about yourself now. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what you mean by that. Oh, she could now interview you for a full, a full. Oh, well, she did. Your she did. Oh, okay. I'm one. I'm one of the 100. Yeah. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, and she sat behind the camera. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I'll now, to definitely go watch you that do, one. But you <laughs> do know that. these weren't really interviews. I mean, mm-hmm. the way it worked was that, well, the way interviews normally work is that you ask questions and people answer them and, and, and it's like 60 minutes, you know, and, and, the, but the problem with that method, it's great for the news, I guess, but it doesn't work for this because, because you don't know that the questions themselves are not leading the interviewee in a direction that, that is true, that is authentic. Um, and so what I did instead was I decided not to ask any questions. And I simply prepared them with the idea that they would come into the studio for 60 minutes. They would, they would have the chance to tell us their story. 
I basically wanted them to do it in 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 chronological order if they could or or and if they didn't want to do that, that was fine too. Uh, some people deviated from that, um, but most people went through it in chronological order. Um, you know, including their time in Korea, their adoption, their upbringing, um, their coming into adulthood, all the way up till the present, and. And essentially, the only questioning that I did, I guess, the only role I played was to remind them kind of where they were and uh, and uh, restart them at, at a different mm-hmm. milestone, you know, the next milestone. So so uh, as a result of that, people only talked about what they wanted to talk about. They only described what they thought was important. Um, and the unanticipated result of that was they ended up talking about a lot of things that that I never would have asked about and that they never would have even thought that they would talk about. Hmm. So uh, it was it was a surprising experience for for both sides of the camera. Um, yeah, it was yeah. it was uh, an amazing experience. That again, that's why I like it when people watch the full interviews. So I did, uh, I, I happened to watch yours today and I, when I was going through and I was, I was watching some more and getting more caught up and I was wondering what, did you always plan to be one of those hundred interviews or did that come up in during the process of filming with everyone else that you're like, okay, I, I think I'm, I'm going to do this as well. Um, I guess I had planned to be one of the interviews, but I spent most of the production period in denial of that. Uh, <laughs> and, and I was number 100. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was a very scary experience for me. Um, not because, you know, I being in front of the camera is fine, but, um, scary is the wrong word. Uh, I had a lot to live up to. Mm. 99 people had come into our studio or a studio and had told us the truth. Mm-hmm. They were completely vulnerable, completely honest, completely truthful, completely revealing about their experiences and their memories and, and their perspectives. And I had a lot to live up to. I don't know that I did. I, I in fact, in fact, honestly, Throughout the course of post-production, uh, I become more convinced that I'm still learning things and still understanding things and still coming to terms with things that I could have talked about then. But as I tell everybody in the project, that interview was a snapshot in time, you know, and no matter how much you change, no matter how much you learn, no matter how much your circumstances are become different. Um, that snapshot in time will always be valuable to somebody. Yeah, I can, because of that being a snapshot, I can see you even going back and asking what's changed since that snapshot. Since, um, because as you said, you changed from the conference, you changed from the beginning of the the documentary to the end of it. I, I wonder how many lives you changed by having them come into the studio and ask that question uh, for them to tell their stories. I wonder if they, and I'm sure they did, got some self-reflection out of that and and went out and learned more. I mean, I think all of us here on, on our show, uh, Patrick and KJ and I have all developed even over the two months of doing this. Um, so that's, have you considered going back and asking any of the uh, uh, the participants again? Uh, well, first of all, I'm in contact with any number of them, uh, and I know that their lives have changed. Um, I don't really think we're prepared to take on part two of this project. <laughs> uh, part one, I think we have not fulfilled the potential of part one yet. Right. So, so, and, and I'm content with the idea that we have these snapshots in time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I want to go back to something you just said, which was you know, what, what it, what it was, what it ended up, what it ended up being for those who told their story. Um, I said, I didn't ask any questions. That actually isn't true. I asked one question at the end of most of the interviews. 
I asked, what of any of what you've told me have you told to other people before this? And the almost uniform answer was very little. Mm-hmm. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, we, we as human beings, we don't often get the chance to tell our stories in this really complete single session way, right? So, and and nobody seems to be that interested, you know, for most of us. So, <laughs> so I get that. But there's another reason why that's true, and it's a it's it's a more important and 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 I think, frankly, darker reason. And the reason is because most of the stories people told us ran very counter to the traditional social narrative about intercountry adoption. If the traditional social narrative is about rescue and compassion and and the love of a, of a forever home and 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 this fairy tale ending which in some cases is true, but obviously in other cases is not. Um, well, these stories very much run counter to that. And it's not, it, and they're not an indictment of adoption. They're not an indictment of intercountry adoption at all. All these people are saying is this was my experience with, with it. This was my life experience. It wasn't simple. It wasn't easy. It was... It was something that I struggle with today. And there are areas of pain associated with my, with my life and with my origin and with my, my coming to terms with my identity that, that are real. And, and the problem is, is because the social narrative is so prevalent, none of us want to tell that story at a party, right? <laughs> right. So... So when people you're saying that's say that's not a good when, party opener. <laughs> well, when so when people when people ask you or find out at a party that you were adopted and they're they're asking you questions about that as people do, you're not going to tell them the real story, right? <laughs> you're going to tell them the the story that fits in the in in the acceptable yeah. narrative, mm-hmm. and and so yeah, that's the darker reason why nobody tells the has told these stories or all of these stories you know, prior to that time in our, in the studio. Um, And I think that's why these sessions were important to people because to be able to articulate all of that finally, and for once, um, I'm glad we were able to give them a chance to do that. I'm glad I had a chance to do that, even though I didn't do as good a job as a lot of people did. <laughs> I love that, um, that that you're moving side by side to a new medium. Uh, I am a big uh, audio content uh, ingester. I don't know how to say that in a not I like it uh, in a more normal you way, I guess. But I, I I take in audio content like a maniac. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to to hear side by side on Audible. Um, I'm excited to hear uh, your commentary on it, and I'm curious. As you've gone back to this project a number of times now, first, you know, in the initial post-production and then thinking about it uh, for the, the documentary and, and the thing for the New York Times, and then again as, uh, as a video kind of art exhibit, uh, has anything, I guess, what's been the timeline for that? And, and uh, ha- has your thoughts on the project changed or just been reinforced going back to that well? No, they've, they've changed. Um, you know... I'm a I'm a writer by trade, and uh, I was a writer in advertising, if if you call that writing, I don't know. Um, uh, so I've been writing about this project since the very beginning of it in 2013, um, and putting it out there, you know, in the form of all kinds of things, ranging from, you know, trying to find people who wanted to become part of the project, you know, to updating those people, and you know, to public public articles and stuff. So those articles, my writing about this project has changed dramatically since the beginning. And even it's even changed over the last couple of years, quite a bit. And I I thought I was thinking about that the other day, trying to understand why it's changed so much. And I think it's because I've changed a lot, even in the last couple of years. Um, I am more 
I am more disclosing of my my personal issues with with uh, uh, my struggles with my origin and and my upbringing and my inability to deal with any of this over the course of my adulthood. I'm I'm much more revealing of that today than I was, and and I'm much more willing to reveal that it was painful. Guys in America don't talk about personal pain. I mean, we bitch, you know, but but we don't we don't really talk. We don't really talk about personal pain, right? So, at least I didn't. I mean, maybe maybe. Maybe young guys do. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, I never did, and so it was very difficult for me to to express uh, my experiences in terms of pain, and therefore that kind of rubbed off on how I wrote about the project. And so I wrote wrote about the project very, very objectively, mm. telling myself that this is a good thing because I don't want to overlay my my personal feelings, you know, on the project, right? But it, but it really didn't, it really wasn't that, you know, um, because, because nothing about writing for the project really prevented me from being more honest about myself and what I was learning over the course of this project. And, and I really needed to disclose more of that. And that's what I'm doing recently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I just watched Over the Moon uh, on Netflix. Didn't know it was a movie. I thought it was a TV show. And so uh, it was late at night and I was like, oh, I guess I'm in for a later night than I anticipated. Um, and I I uh, wept openly uh, in the first like four minutes. Um, I think just because of, of doing See, the I show. I never would have admitted and that. So. <laughs> I, uh, I have no problem making people feel uncomfortable. Uh, so, and if that comes at my own expense, then so be it. Um, <laughs> I, so I, you know, we're watching this story and uh, obviously it's all Asian characters, uh, all Chinese mm. characters. And, um, and we, it's about like the, the Chinese moon festival uh, which I just learned about my own Korean moon festival uh, just like two weeks ago or however long ago that was. Um, and then the mom dies and I've been uh, reading on Instagram and, and having these conversations with that dark side of adoption, that sense of loss uh, or the feeling that, you know, like that something was taken away from me. And so I'm already uh, triggered by family things as I found out when I watched Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is really deep for me. Um, but <laughs> Uh, but I, I just, and I wasn't prepared for that. Um, but I, I've found that as I have been on this journey of, uh, interviewing other adoptees of hanging out with Nathan and Patrick and Jerry, and just learning more about, um, my own roots as a Korean American adoptee, uh, that I find that I want representation for adoptees that like just Asian American representation isn't good enough. And, uh, because of other Asian Americans um, and things like the podcast, the Asian Americans, or just like, you know, whatever other uh, Asians in media, I've also learned that I shouldn't be content with saying like, well, Asian Americans are, are gaining more, more representation in media and that is good enough, but that also I should be fighting for my own voice and saying like, no, I want adoptee voices uh, and I want adoptee stories to be heard. Um, so I'm so excited about Side by Side, but I'm curious um, what your thoughts are on, you know, kind of with an eye to the future, what's the next project? Um, and um, where, what are more spaces that we adoptees can add our voices to? Uh, podcast spaces um, being entered into by ours <laughs> and some others, but, um, nice. you know, are there other film projects? Are there other books or, yeah, what's, what else what else can we do well first of all you know you guys are just part of a of a huge movement of adult adoptee voices i mean you must know that right so yeah. i mean there's a huge movement here and it's and it started with academics mm. um but it is clearly extended to to you know all mediums and and of course digital production and all of those things has, has helped that, uh, immeasurably, but, but it's, 
there's a huge movement here. And, and I think that, that uh, the fact that out of a million intercountry adoptees worldwide, um, you know, you do the numbers on that, 90% of us are adults. And in fact, a fair substantial fraction of those are old adults, right? Yeah. So Glenn, we're not ageist on the show. They are <laughs> they are they're 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 in their thirties, they're in their forties. In other words, they're in the peaks of their careers. They they are getting the credibility and the platforms to 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 be those voices. And, and you guys are perfect examples of that. And that's just happening all over the place. And so, you know, I, I, I couldn't be happier to be part of this movement. I couldn't be happier to have, to have been part of providing, you know, a body of stories that are going to be hard to replicate by, by anybody. I mean, it's a, it's a, it would be a tough thing to replicate. Um, and so I'm glad that we could contribute that. And, and I feel like that's what we've done. That's, that's what, that's what we brought to the party. Um, I think from here, uh, I, I really want to support other adoptees in those platforms and in their efforts to tell their stories because more stories is better. You know, uh, I've been deeply inspired by an author that I'm sure, you know, uh, Chimamanda, Ngozi Adichie, mm-hmm. uh, who talks about the danger of a single story. And I think that is such a succinct thought that, that a single story can lead to stereotypes and cliches, but many stories creates real understanding and real representation. And, uh, and so you know, even though many of the individual projects that are out there in the world today from adult adoptees are individual stories, it's the cumulative effect that excites me so much. It's the fact that there's so many stories out there right now uh, in literature, in entertainment, in on the on the video screen. It's it's just it just blows my mind. I mean, to that effect, I agree you're. Your project is going to be one of the ones that will go down in history of the Korean adoptees as as one of the greats. And so we thank you for doing that and really thank you for being on our show to talk about it as well. It's really my pleasure to be here. This has been awesome. When does your Audible project drop? November 5, one week from today. Of course, I don't know when you're gonna when you're gonna distribute this podcast, but November 5. So for nice. the listeners, it comes out tomorrow. Wait, is that right? It comes out Friday. No, it comes out yep. Friday in two yes. days. Sorry, <laughs> we'll edit that. We'll just we'll just KJ will just edit that together. Wait, no, it's November. No, 5th. no, no the, the Thursday. That's a Thursday. It's a Thursday. So Thursday it's November come out tomorrow. 5th. Oh yeah, so it right. does come so it comes out tomorrow. tomorrow. I was out tomorrow. Yeah. You'll, You'll be right able to find it. Time. You'll be able to find it on Audible.com. Awesome. Yes, I oh, cannot we'll wait. Definitely check that out. And if that's when, and if that's when the this podcast is going to break, then. Then I hope that your listeners might might join us for Adoptee Hub's uh, fundraising event, where 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 I'm going to be doing a little talking, uh, as usual. But more importantly, there's going to be several side by side participants mm. who are going to join a panel and really talk about their stories and 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 how what it was like to participate in side by side. Awesome. Excellent. I'm in. Count me in. Yeah. And so your your material is on um side by side, uh, you know, side, side X side, side for those people who think I'm saying b- b- by side. Uh side. Actually, side, it, right? it's no, it's spelled out side no, by. Oh, I thought side there was an side. also side X side. Okay. I well, that's that the logo the, which is the, the stylization. <laughs> that's confusing, but Now uh, I just confused everyone. I'm sorry. Let's yeah. scratch that out. We'll, we'll edit yeah. that out. Just ignore Thanks me. Thanks a lot, Nathan. But it's, <laughs> it's, the, the, the website is sidebysideproject.com. Okay. Sidebysideproject.com. And there are other places that uh, our viewers can find you? On Instagram, uh, on YouTube? Yeah, Instagram, Facebook, uh, you know, uh, Twitter, YouTube. I mean, look for Given Away on YouTube with the New York Times. Uh, oh, and, and, and it's important to mention, the, too, that the Audible original 
is also going to be called given away. Mm, okay. uh, given it's away. not going to be called side by side. It's going to be called given away. Right. Same right. as the New York Times op doc. Given away on audible.com coming out tomorrow. Woo! Tomorrow, November 5th. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you guys. Uh, yeah, I really yeah, appreciate you really coming appreciate on. It. Seriously. All right. Well, uh, I think if people stick around for a little bit longer, we'll be coming right back with some sort of food item. It's a mystery, as always. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we have a surprise mystery item today, number seven. We do not know what it is, but we are going to find out very soon. It looks like a bag of chips. As they, it sounds like a bag of chips. Maybe it's like another shrimp. Ooh, maybe it's uh, what is it? Squid and peanut butter crackers. Oh, oh my no! God. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no! Dude, please not. Right. Please I'm gonna no. jump right in. Oh, and it's not more onions. Diving right in. It's oh. It's whale crackers. Whale crackers. Whale. I don't know what none it says of in the them front, look though. like whales. First, first thing I notice is none of these crackers are whale shaped. Yeah, I was gonna say all those other ones are like. Is it a harpoon? That's kind of like. <laughs> oh no, there is a whale one. Look at the top. There's a top. Oh, it looks like oh, actually, oh, that's a dolphin. a dolphin. Dolphin. Never mind. <laughs> maybe there's a maybe there's a whale in here. I don't know. <laughs> It smells cheddar-y. Okay. From kind of. Orion. Oh. Yep. Wait, where is it? does it say it in English? No, on the just, back uh, it says orionworld.com. Right here. That's how I knew. <laughs> oh, nice. I was like, I didn't know that you could read Hangul. You've been studying. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Yeah, mine's got some. Probably can read uh, less so than these are now. called Wang Korebap. Korebap. Yep. Seasoning. Which Wang makes, it makes, I don't know, like, because obviously every culture has different onomatopoeia sounds, but Wang is like a, makes me think of like a Wang, like a ching kind of like oh, yeah. thing. But, and I have Sound no idea effect. what Korebap is, but uh, that's what it is. Um, this is a very interesting looking chip, too. I would say it, uh, oh, here's, I found the whale. First one. Um, Cut, it, so it reminds me of extract those, powder. It reminds ingredients. me of uh, those little onion, uh, onion, young putty. Oh, like like you put in a, a green bean casserole. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. That's what it okay. looks like when, when you just visually look at it. That's Interesting. What it looks like. Okay. However, not what no. I expected it to smell like. What's it smell like? I don't know. Seafood. It's a slight seafood smell to it. Very, Wait, very. Thin. Yeah, I don't actually know how to describe that. It actually smelled different the second time I lifted it to my nose. I can't really make a. I like them. I mean, they're not um, they're not overly powerful in any, in they're any savory. form. They hmm. what are these? Well, this this feels familiar to me. What am I eating? This does taste very familiar. It's a very close relationship to chicken of the sea or the biscuit of the. <laughs> what? Is it? what? What are those chicken what? biscuit crackers that have like a um, chicken flavor? You know what I'm talking about? Chicken and biscuit crackers. Have you ever had no. chicken and biscuit crackers? No. Am I saying that wrong? Look, I found a whale. I, I mean, these are addicting. I, at first, I'm like, because it's nothing like a, like a serious, strong flavor. It's just kind of mildly seafood. A little bit of salt, which I like. It's it's not too overly powerful salt. It's got good crunch. It's airy. They're like mm -hmm. they're like almost hollow in the inside. They're really crispy, which is nice. Good yeah. crunch. I'm trying oh, to place house. that taste. Mm -hmm. I know there's something else that I almost like a not a triscuit but chicken um, and biscuit cracker. Oh yeah, I I'm guess that's probably. I swear that's what it is. That, I mean, there is like a drumstick. What's the other kind of here? triscuit? Oh yeah, there you go. There's meat flavor. Whoa, that's weird. Have you guys ever had cuttlefish? Mm -mm. You have now. <laughs> I know. I saw that what? cuttlefish extract. Powder. Cuttlefish extract powder. Oh, this says stir fried seasoning. Stir fried, is stir fried what that seasoning. Picture is welcome, young mm. yum, young yum mat. That makes a lot of sense now that you say it's stir fried. Hmm. But I'm not used to seeing stir fry with whole ingredients. Not <laughs> chopped up yeah, not, I'm not used to seeing the finished product of a stir fry <laughs> that is also clearly grilled and not stir fried. <laughs> All right. So, how many uh, stir fried meats do you give this korebap? 
Nathan, let's start with it's you. A dick, it's addicting. I, I'm going to have to give it... I'm going to give it a solid four. Um, I could I could eat these. It, it's crunchy. It's not too salty. I like it. Mm. What about you, Patrick? Um, Sorry, I'm eating them. <laughs> I'd also give it a four. Um, I like the taste. It's a solid taste. I like the packaging. I think you get a lot of storytelling packages these days, and I really enjoy that. So you're going to give this a four? I don't know. I just, I mean, I keep eating them, so it yeah, I know. makes They're the addicting. rating go up. Also, okay, so Wang is king. It's not onomatopoeia. Okay. And Gole is uh, whale, and Bap is rice. So this is literally king, king whale rice, rice. rice. snack. Chips. King. So it's king whale it? rice snack. I like that. But I like that. That's a, a great name for a snack. But it's wheat flour. It's not a rice flour. Well, I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> this is what I read. Bop. Uh, pop? Uh, is it P-A-B? Yeah, that, that B-A-B is that like... B-A-B. B-A-B. It's romanized as B slash P, so uh, it kind of depends. Oh, okay. Blood pressure. Uh, I still like them. Still get a four. Um, yeah, I'm going to give this like a three and a half. All right. I really like the chip. But I don't love the flavor. Pick it up. So, if I had not stir fry flavor, I'd be like, yeah, this is good. <laughs> but like the young young pudding, I destroyed those. Finished them in the recording. These mm-hmm. definitely not gonna finish in the recording. <laughs> Same. But they're good. The good munchies. If I'm like, yeah, just want something crunchy to munch on. Same. So and now yeah, I would say I would pet. go for the onion flavored rings prior or before these. Yeah. Same. Yeah, sure. Young pudding over. Young pudding. What are you? How, what are you? How are you pronouncing that? Young pudding. Young pudding. Yeah. So young pang is onion and then ring. Mm. So young pang, young yeah. pudding. Not bad. Interesting. Well, if you guys want to find some of these <laughs> chips, go to your local uh, Korean store uh, or orionworld.com. And you can find maybe they have d- different flavors. And uh, if you need to watch us, we're on the John Chi Show. Dot com, John Chi Show. Oh yeah! On all locations, we'll have our website up very soon. No pressure. You keep promoting that, and I'm like, bro, I still got to turn that into a web. There, a WordPress but there is site. a temporary website right now, so you can. I mean, still yeah, go there. you can you can go there for some stuff, but we're still yeah. working on on the features. The final uh, the full website. Full website will be coming soon, so stay tuned on that. But uh, send us a send us a DM if you have any suggestions on what we should be eating too. And also Ooh, give yes. us your take on what we've eaten already, yeah. including and if you've tried these too. The king yeah. whale, the king rice cracker. Uh, rice cracker. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Slash wheat. I forgot. All right. Well, you can find me at KJ Relke on all places on the internet that I want to be found. I'm at No Walk Photo, and you can find me in St. Louis rolling on dubs. Just kidding. Uh, that was. I a, don't know that reference. <laughs> that was a St. Lunatics. <laughs> Uh, reference you can find me at Patrick in the world on Instagram and that's about it I am where else I am being more engaging on Facebook now so say something and I might comment maybe happy not, happy November adoption awareness month Korean adoption is it awareness, awareness month, month or is it just like adoption month it's like Korean um, if you could just do all of your adoptions awareness. right now in November, I think it's awareness I think it's I think it's oh, I think your awareness aware. I am awareness <laughs> <laughs> all right Thank you guys for watching. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.